Um, so let's go right now and to watch a video about our story for today. So we can understand what is the unit or the story in general going to be about. How does facing challenges help us learn about ourselves? It's probably no coincidence that many accomplished people have had to face enormous challenges in their lives. These challenges just may be the motivation they needed to succeed. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the 32nd president of the United States. He led our country through some very difficult times, including World War II. Roosevelt was paralyzed from the waist down due to a disease called polio. He was known for his self-reliance. Despite the fact that he used a wheelchair, he traveled all over the world. Ludwig van Beethoven is one of the greatest classical composers ever. He composed much of his music after losing his hearing. Beethoven must have felt exasperation as his hearing dimmed in his later years, but he continued to play and create new works of art. Jim Abbott was a baseball player who was born without a right hand. As a child, he loved playing baseball and practiced for hours in his backyard. He was a great pitcher, but he needed to be able to field the ball as well. He showed initiative and practiced to move over and over again that allowed him to switch his glove off and on quickly to his good hand. Abbott played for four major league baseball teams in his professional career. Challenges may be internal, like finding the motivation to work hard, or they may be external, like the uncontrolled spread of a disease. But overcoming challenges can be a positive influence on your life. How do you think facing challenges help us learn about ourselves? Okay, my girls, this question for you. What, how do you think that challenges that we face every day that can affect our life and how we can overcome it? Hmm. How do you think a challenge affects our life? In which way? Miss, I can't understand the question. I mean that if you face some challenges, like for example, right now we, ch we face the challenge of coronavirus. How do you think that affects our life and how we can overcome it? What do you think? Um, like, uh, everything it has to be, like, um, there, here's COVID-19. We have to do our, like, um, important thing. We have to put hygiene, wear a mask, wear gloves. Um, then, uh, inshallah, there is no COVID-19. Like, um, then if, like, there is a problem, you have to, to like, solve this problem uh, without, like, if you want to solve this problem, you, you don't have to solve it with a wrong, a wrong thing. Like, if there's two girls is fighting, do, don't say, oh, this girl is fighting with her, this girl is tired. Just let them friends. So every, every problem, like, you have to solve it by yourself or, like, um, you have to solve it. Excellent. So, actually, sometimes uh, we, we have to live with the thing that we are in and with the difficulty that we have and try to learn from it as much as we can so we we can't repeat the wrong thing and we can't do something wrong or a mistake when we deal with that thing and yeah. for example for coronavirus what what coronavirus made us learn about ourselves for example because every challenge we face in our life it makes us learn something about ourselves for example a strength that you don't know that i have this much of a strength Oh, I didn't know that I can be this patient. I can't. I didn't know before that I can bear staying in home that much. I didn't know that I have this talent of drawing. And when I stayed home, I realized that I can draw. I can write. I can do whatever I like. There's a lot of talents that's hidden in me. So in every challenge that we face, we will learn that we have a hidden. We have a hidden talent or a hidden thing inside of us, and we learn it inside this challenge and difficulty. Type right now, I want you to open your books on the page 336 and the story of Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Okay, did you open it? Okay, so the author of our story today is Gary Paulson. Who is Gary Paulson? I want you to open your books. 
on the page 351. 351 and read about Gary Wilson. Gary Wilson, as you can see him in this picture. He's from America. Yes, he's American author. Miss, if you open to like page 51, there's two books. He say here are other books about several brilliant winter and my side of the mountain. So this books, they can buy it in like Jarir? Yes, they yes. yes you, anything that's a global, globally recognized, you can find it in Jarir or Amazon. If you go for Jarir, you'll find most of the books that we had. Gary Paulson. And if you don't find it in Jarir, you can search it on Amazon online, you'll find it online. Gary Paulson is one of America's most important writers of books for young people. Hatchet, a modern day classic, is a new, uh, a Newbery owner book, as are his novels, uh, Dog Song and The Winter Room. Mr. Paulson's life changed the wintry day he went into a Minnesota liber library to warm up. He says that the, li the, libra the librarian asked me if I would like a library card. I was a real cocky kid and, and said, sure, why not? So she gave me a card and the most astonishing thing happened. This silly little card with my name on it gave me an identity I had not had. I felt I had become somebody. And he read up to a book a day. When he was young, Mr. Paulson tried a number of jobs to support himself from migrant work to ranch hand to truck driver. Many of his books about the outdoors and based on his early life as a hunter and trapper and his lately and his later years running um, the editor dog sled race and sailing the Pacific. He now lives with his wife in New Mexico. So this person, Gary Paulson, he became a writer by uh, coincidence, we can say. Because as a younger child, he used to go to the library every since in a while to read a book. The librarian, the woman wa was in the library, supervising the library, she saw that this person is eager to come every day and to read a book. So she offered him to have a card for the library. So whenever he wants to come, he can come and stay for hours and read whatever he likes. And he can borrow the books that he wants. So with this card, his life changed. Why? Because subhanAllah, as I told you, the, the brain is like a muscle. Whenever you train it more, it will give you more. Which means that if you, if you read every day, then you will become a great writer after that because that will give you the ability to know different styles of writing. You will have a lot of ideas and imagination of all the stories that you read. Then after that, you have a lot of information in your mind, in your mind. So your mind after that want to express it. How to express it? Maybe by drawing, maybe by writing, maybe by anything. But the brain will express eventually. How it express? It's the work of your brain. Just leave it. Okay. So whenever you train your brain on something, believe me, that outcome will come sooner or later. If you read so much, one day you will become a read a writer. If you uh, if you watch a lot of painting, one day you will become a painter. If you listen to music so much, maybe one day you will become a musician. So everything that you train your brain to do, one day you will have the ability to do that in a master way, in a powerful way. So this person this is how he started his writing career by only having a card in a library and reading and reading and reading when he grew up he has different jobs but he always back to his always first love which is writing and whenever he writes he just spread those books and publish it for the libraries and guess what now he is one of the most american important writers in america and he's living in new mexico with his wife these are some of the books that he wrote. Okay, and Hatchet is one among them. 
going back to our story and to the first page, what is the genre of our story today? Who can tell me? Realistic fiction. Realistic fiction. What does it mean, realistic fiction, Yaleen? Huh? What does it mean, realistic fiction? Is it real or fake? No real. Huh? Lien, you are muted. What does it mean, realistic oh, fiction? Oh, oh. Oh. It means like it's it's like imaginary. Imaginary, okay. And the it character... seems real, but like it's imaginary. Yes, it seems real. It can happen for anybody in the real life, but the characters are from the imagination. Okay, and the question of this week, what we are going to focus about is how does facing challenges help us learn about ourselves? Brian is on his way to visit his father in northern Canada when the pilot of the small, single-engine plane in which he is flying suffers a fatal heart attack. Forced to crash land the plane, Brian suddenly finds himself alone in the Canadian wilderness with only a hatchet to help him survive. At first, he thought it was a growl. In the still darkness of the shelter in the middle of the night, his eyes came open and he was awake and he thought there was a growl. But it was the wind, a medium wind in the pines had made some sound that brought him up, brought him awake. He sat up and was hit with the smell. It terrified him. The smell was one of rot, some musty rot that made him think only of graves with cobwebs and dust and old death. His nostrils widened and he opened his eyes wider, but he could see nothing. It was too dark, too hard dark with clouds covering even the small light from the stars, and he could not see. But the smell was alive, alive and full and in the shelter. He thought of the bear, thought of Bigfoot and every monster he had ever seen in every fright movie he had ever watched, and his heart hammered in his throat. Then he heard the slithering, a brushing sound, a slithering brushing sound near his feet. And he kicked out as hard as he could, kicked out and threw the hatchet at the sound, a noise coming from his throat. But the hatchet missed, sailed into the wall where it hit the rocks with a shower of sparks, and his leg was instantly torn with pain, as if a hundred needles had been driven into it. Ung! Um. Okay, this is the beginning of the story. It's very exciting. This person, yeah. his name is Brian, he was in his way to visit his father in northern Canada, and suddenly, with the pilot of the small single-engine plane, and when he is a flying, suffers a fatal heart attack and then forced to crash land the plane. Now the plane crashed into the woods and this person in the middle of nowhere alone. And when he woke up, he smelled a bad smell. There's somebody, somebody who is dead and there's a big sound of a growling. He thought it's a growl of a bear. Maybe there's, there's a, a, an animal near of him, but no, it was only the wind blowing near of the airplane he's in the middle of the woods he wanted to wake up and to to uh to go outside but it was very very dark and i want you to remember right here he's in the middle of the woods inside the airplane and it's night and there's no lights whatsoever there's no lights there's no mobile to to give him a, a light <laughs> or a lamp or anything he is alone with all darkness around him and there's nobody to hear him, no radio, no phone, no nothing. And then he felt something near of his, uh, of his foot. And he thought, maybe it's a monster, maybe it's a bear, maybe it's a big foot, he will eat me right now. I don't know what is this. But then he felt some pain in his what? In his uh, legs as a needle had burnt inside his leg. And he said, oh, what was that? Let's see what was that. Now he screamed with the pain and fear and skittered on his backside up into the corner of the shelter, breathing through his mouth, straining to see, to hear. The slithering moved again. He thought toward him at first, and terror took him, stopping his breath. 
He felt he could see a low, dark form, a bulk in the darkness, a shadow that lived. But now it moved away, slithering and scraping. It moved away, and he saw, or thought he saw, it go out of the door opening. He lay on his side for a moment, then pulled a rasping breath in and held it, listening for the attacker to return. When it was apparent that the shadow wasn't coming back, he felt the calf of his leg, where the pain was centered and spreading to fill the whole leg. His fingers gingerly touched a group of needles that had been driven through his pants and into the fleshy part of his calf. They were stiff and very sharp on the ends that stuck out, and he knew then what the attacker had been. A porcupine had stumbled into his shelter, and when he had kicked it, the thing had slapped him with its tail of quills. He touched each quill carefully. The pain made it seem as if dozens of them had been slammed into his leg, but there were only eight, pinning the cloth against his skin. He leaned back against the wall for a minute. He couldn't leave them in; they had to come out. But just touching them made the pain more intense. Wow,、well, poor man! So this man, he doesn't even have to suffer that he's alone in the middle of nowhere and with a plane to crash. No, but what happened was、uh, a porcupine entered the airplane and tried to attack that person. He, this porcupine, was searching for a food and thought the airplane was empty. When the man right there saw something. Right there inside the airplane, and he thought it's a bear attacking him or something because it was so dark. So he attacked it with the hatchet that he had. The hatchet missed the porcupine, but the porcupine felt the danger, so he put all of his needles inside the feet of that person, and then he moved away. That person, Brian, he went to the corner of the airplane, and he was. All scared and afraid of what what's going on and who is this and it's so dark and he has a million thoughts in his mind, but the pain in his feet and his feet made him unable to think about anything else. And he touched those、uh, needles and those quills inside his feet and he realized that there's a porcupine that attacked him actually, and he had to remove those spi spines from his feet because if it stay there. Then he can't move. He can't walk, and、uh, if he leave it, he can't walk with it. And if if he remove it, it will make it more agony for him. But anyway, he has to remove it and to take the pain if he wants to walk again on his feet. So let's see what happened next with that poor man. So fast, he thought. So fast, things change. When he'd gone to sleep, he had satisfaction, and in just a moment, it was all different. He grasped one of the quills, held his breath, and jerked. It sent pain signals to his brain in tight waves. But he grabbed another, pulled it, then another quill. When he had pulled four of them, he stopped for a moment. The pain had gone from being a pointed injury pain to spreading in a hot smear up his leg, and it made him catch his breath. Some of the quills were driven in deeper than others, and they tore when they came out. He breathed deeply twice, let half of the breath out, and went back to work. Jerk, pause, jerk, and three more times before he lay back in the darkness. Done. The pain filled his leg now, and with it came new waves of self-pity. Sitting alone in the dark, his leg aching, some mosquitoes finding him again, he started crying. It was all too much, just too much, and he couldn't take it. Not the way it was. I can't take it this way, alone with no fire and in the dark. And next time it might be something worse, maybe a bear, and it wouldn't be just quills in the leg. It would be worse. I can't do this," he thought again and again. "I can't." Brian pulled himself up until he was sitting upright, back in the corner of the cave. He put his head down on his arms across his knees, with stiffness taking his left leg, and cried until he was cried out. He did not know how long it took, but later he looked back on this time of crying in the corner of the dark cave and thought of it as when he learned the most important rule of survival. Which was that feeling sorry for yourself didn't work. It wasn't just that it was wrong to do, or that it was considered incorrect.
It was more than that. It didn't work. When he sat alone in the darkness and cried and was done, was all done with it. Nothing had changed. His leg still hurt. It was still dark. He was still alone, and the self-pity had accomplished nothing. At last he slept again, but already his patterns were changing, and the sleep was light, a resting doze more than a deep sleep, with small sounds awakening him twice in the rest of the night. In the last doze period before daylight, before he awakened finally with the morning light and the clouds of new mosquitoes, he dreamed. This time it was not of his mother, but of his father at first, and then of his friend Terry. In the initial segment of the dream, his father was standing at the side of a living room looking at him, and it was clear from his expression that he was trying to tell Brian something. His lips moved, but there was no sound, not a whisper. He waved his hands at Brian, made gestures in front of his face, as if he were scratching something, and he worked to make a word with his mouth, but at first Brian could not see it. Okay, so now Brian, he has to survive all of this and to stay alive, because if he don't stay alive, nobody will know about him, and nobody will know where the plane crashed in the first place. So he has to pull himself out of the airplane, and to ha he has to go to a cave near of that place to feel some safety. And then to pull out all those needles and quills from his feet, which was so agony that he was taking a breath and shouting between each one and another. He has only eight quills inside his, fit, his feet, but it felt like he is trying to pull out knives, not only quills. And he spent some time after... Uh, he, he pulled it all and he started to cry because he felt like, what is this? Where am, where am I? I wanted to visit my father and now I am in the middle of nowhere and fighting f things that I never imagined that I would fight and not only have a crash, crashing at a plane, but now I have a quills inside my leg and I can't have fire, I can't have warm, I'm so cold and there is nobody with me and it's so dark. What should I do? And he was so crying and pitying about himself. But the thing is, that thing and that feeling didn't last for a long time. Why? Because he thought about himself. Okay, I will pity about myself. I will cry. But then what? Nobody will hear my crying. Nobody will understand that I am here alone. Nobody knows that I'm here. So if I don't stand for myself and help myself, nobody will help me. Nobody will, will learn who, where I am, okay? So he, he said to himself, I have to gather up myself. I have to stand up with myself and I have to be for myself there. And he, has, he said to himself, I have to get some sleep right now. And then when I wake up, I have to search for a fire. I have to search for a food and I have to search for a shelter until the people know that I'm lost right here. So he didn't lost hope. And he realized at that time, at that moment, when he has the pain and the needles inside his feet, he realized that right now I have the necessary strength to survive this. I am strong enough to survive all of this and to be alive. And you know what? I'm going to do it and I'm going to be there for myself because there is nobody for me. So I have to be there for myself. When he went to sleep a little bit, he saw his father and his father wanted to hold his hand and to tell him something in the dream. And this dream actually gave him some power so he can move on. Because you know what? When he wanted to come here, he wanted to visit his father in the first place. So that's why he is here right now inside the cave and the plane is crashed. He wanted to see his father. And when he slept, he dreamed about his father. And his father was there to encourage him and to give him the strength that he needed to move on and to go with his, this survival story. Let's see next what happened to Brian. Do you think that he will survive later or no? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's see about that. Then the lips made an mmm shape, but no sound came. Mmm. -a. Brian could not hear it, could not understand it, and he wanted to so badly. It was so important to understand his father, to know what he was saying. 
He was trying to help, trying so hard. And when Brian couldn't understand, he looked cross, the way he did when Brian asked questions more than once. And he faded. Brian's father faded into a fog place Brian could not see. And the dream was almost over, or seemed to be, when Terry came. He was not gesturing to Brian, but was sitting in the park at a bench, looking at a barbecue pit, and for a time, nothing happened. Then he got up and poured some charcoal from a bag into the cooker, then some starter fluid, and he took a flick type of lighter and lit the fluid. When it was burning and the charcoal was at last getting hot, he turned, noticing Brian for the first time in the dream. He turned and smiled and pointed to the fire as if to say, See? A fire. But it meant nothing to Brian except that he wished he had a fire. He saw a grocery sack on the table next to Terry. Brian thought it must contain hot dogs and chips and mustard, but he could think of only the food. But Terry shook his head and pointed again to the fire, and twice more he pointed to the fire, made Brian see the flames, and Brian felt his frustration and anger rise, and he thought, all right, all right, I see the fire, but so what? I don't have a fire. I know about fire. I know I need a fire. I know that. Okay, so now Brian is inside the dream. And he's dreaming about his father. His, his father trying to tell him something inside the dream. But he failed to do that because he tried to, to mutter the, the words. And he was murmuring the whole, the whole dream, trying to say the words and utter it, but unable to do that. So inside the dream, he wanted to wake up. But before the dream finished, he found his friend Terry inside the dream again. And Terry, he was maiden, making a fire inside the dream. So actually, Brian, he saw the fire in the dream, but he was thinking about hot dogs and food and chips. And he said, put some, some hot dog on the fire. Let's have some bar barbecue. But Terry, inside the dream, he pointed to the fire a million times. See, fire, fire, fire. Like he's trying to point for the Brian that if you want to survive, then you have to make a fire in the middle of the woods. Why? Because the fire first, it will warm you. Second, it will keep all the enemies of the animals away from you because they will get scared of the light and the fire smell. And second, a third thing, when you hunt anything, any animal like a rabbit or anything, you can uh, you can barbecue that on the, on the fire and you can grill it on the fire. So you need the fire for several things to make you stronger to face the forest situation that you are inside right now you can't stay without a fire because all the animals will smell you and come to eat you so you have to push them away with something so fire is the first thing that make all the animals away from you so now he wake up so angry and frustrated like oh okay i know that i need a fire but how to start that and how to do a fire in the middle of nowhere while i don't have anything with me how to do that and then he remember the hatchet, the one that he throw it for the um, copy corn. Uh, and he said that, oh, that one was the hatchet that I need to make the fire. Let's see what happened. His eyes opened and there was light in the cave, a gray dim light of morning. He wiped his mouth and tried to move his leg, which had stiffened like wood. There was thirst and hunger and he ate some raspberries from the jacket. They had spoiled a bit, seemed softer and mushier, but still had a rich sweetness. He crushed the berries against the roof of his mouth with his tongue and drank the sweet juice as it ran down his throat. A flash of metal caught his eye, and he saw his hatchet in the sand where he had thrown it at the porcupine in the dark. He scooched up, wincing a bit when he bent his stiff leg, and crawled to where the hatchet lay. He picked it up and examined it and saw a chip in the top of the head. The nick wasn't large, but the hatchet was important to him, was his only tool, and he should not have thrown it. He should keep it in his hand and make a tool of some kind to help push an animal away. Make a staff, he thought, or a lance, and save the hatchet. Something came then, a thought as he held the hatchet, something about the dream and his father and Terry, but he couldn't pin it down. Ah... 
he scrambled out and stood in the morning sun and stretched his back muscles and his sore leg. The hatchet was still in his hand, and as he stretched and raised it over his head, it caught the first rays of the morning sun. The first faint light hit the silver of the hatchet and flashed a brilliant gold in the light, like fire. That is it, he thought. What they were trying to tell me. Okay. Now he has an idea. The idea is with all around the hatchet. He remembered, okay, if I need some twigs, if I need some some uh, logs, if I need to make a fire, I need a tool to, th to do that and a sharp tool. Then he remembered, oh, the hatchet, the one that I throw for the, um, for the uh, porcupine. I remembered it. And then he saw it what glowing in the middle of the night. And he saw that, ah, oh, the hatchet is the one that will help me to bring all the logs and to protect me because it's a sharp tool that can be a weapon against all the animals. He took it away and the, then he started to make some woods and he started to what? to search for all the woods that he need to make the fire. Do you think later on he will be able to do the fire or that will be a hard thing for him? No, he will do it. Yeah. He will do it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And why? why do you think that? Because the story is about a hatchet or what? Yeah, I think. Yeah, because he had the tools. He has everything he needs. He has the skills, so and he knows how to start a fire. So yeah. why not start a fire? Exactly. And the thing is, now he believes in himself. Before he was doubting himself and pitying about himself with the crying and spending the day sleeping, worrying and being sorry about himself. But now that he felt that I can do it and I have the strength and he saw his father and his friend inside the dream, now he has the encouragement and the strength that he needed. And most importantly, he has the idea and the tool. Let's see next time what happened with Brian and will he survive? Will anybody come to save him? And how he can spend his other days in the woods alone without food? This is what we are going to learn. In the meanwhile, I want you to go back through the story and to read the pages that we had for today. Until the page 343. Do you have any question, my girls? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. And I will see you tomorrow, inshallah. Have fun and be okay. Bye-bye. Bye, man. -bye. Bye -bye.